Hi, and welcome back to Computer Science for Everyone. In this lecture, we're going to talk about what is probably going to be the most complicated and the most difficult to understand thing in the whole course. So it would be great if you could pay really close attention to what I'm about to try to explain to you. This is what many computer science students get stuck on when they're starting doing computer science. And the question is very simple. What are objects? As you might imagine, I wouldn't be asking you this question if objects were just anything that you could see in front of you. Because then that would not be a very computer science-y question. It would be a more, I don't know, philosophical question. But actually, an object is any single thing. And so so why do we have them in computer science? In, in our computers, we don't have mugs or keyboards or mice or speakers. We don't have anything like that, do we? So why do we have objects? Originally, we started using computers for two reasons. One of them was obviously performing computation. But the other one which we didn't realize until a bit later when we when computers were actually present in our lives. Computers were most used, especially in the recent in light of the recent events, to facilitate data collection. For example, in banks or national security agencies. And they would have table with their customers. And a customer information table will hold some details about the customer. For example, something like this. They'd have the row number, name, number, and address of the customer. So in, in this instance, we have in row one a, a guy called Luke with a certain number, telephone number, or any other number. I'm not sure what that means. And then an address. Then we'd have in row two some Sally, Peter, and Angela with no address, for example. This is brilliant. And then what if our customers were then grouped into different account types. Imagine Luke had two different accounts. Some might have high interest accounts or the low interest accounts. So we could group them differently like so. Here Luke has three different accounts. One of them with 0 0.02 interest, one of them with 0 0.05 interest, and one of them with 0 0.01 interest, depending on how current the account is. So as you can see, we have the name Luke three times, the same number three times, and the same address three times. This is not very good for database, because if we want to change the address of Luke, we have to go to every instance of Luke appearing in a database and change his address there. So we see where that's going. We have the same data in the customer information table and in the accounts table that we've just seen. So wouldn't something like this be easier? Something like assigning a number to each customer, like ID, identification number. Luke would have the number 001. And then swapping out the three times that we have Luke for just three numbers. Swap all those duplicate fields for 001 three times. And then if we want to change the uh, information for Luke, we just have to go to the customer table and change the address once. And then every time we see 001, we know it's Luke. And we just go to the database and change the address there. So why would we do this? Data is what we call encapsulated in the customer information table. So what this means is that the data is only in that one table, and it's nowhere else. The data is not duplicated. If we modify that table, we modify all customers and all references to that customer in any other table. This is very similar to what object-oriented programming is. When we started making programs, we found that we couldn't do this in computers because we still had to tell computers how to deal with the ones and zeros that were displaying the customer information to the screen. We still had to say, tell me the date of birth of this thing that's in memory. And that wasn't too good for us. 
So we came up with a different way to work. We came up with object-oriented programming. And what this means is that in our programs, we create objects. We create a customer called Luke. We create an object, Luke. And this Luke object has an address, a name, a number, and an account. So each object we create in our programs represents one thing that can be translated to a physical thing in the real world. And this way, we can deal with bits of code that represent real things, and this is obviously easier to think about and easier to deal with. Not only that, but they're also easier to modify. Let's say we have one type of object that is a type customer, and then we create one called Luke and one called Sally. If we want to change the underlying customer, we just have to add something to the customer group of objects, and then all customers would have that extra data. So if we change one object definition, all the objects that come from that definition change. So if we now say customers have an age, as well as a name, number, and address, then all customers would have an age, not just Luke or not just Sally, but Luke, Sally, Hillary, and Greg would all have an age. But as I've said, we don't just have one object. So how do we differentiate between objects? There are many different chairs, customers, and cars around us. So each object has a name, an address, and an account. And I've said that if we change an object to have an age, then all of them would have an age. But what value for age? If I say customers now have an age, I still have to specify what value for age each customer has. And this is why we have classes. Classes are the object definitions I was talking about. Classes are the table header that says customers have an age, a name, a number, and address. Classes say objects are going to have these properties. And then the objects say I come from that class. And my values are 35 years old, my name is Josh, number is that, address is that. So an object is something that comes from a class and has the properties defined by the class, but has its own values for each property. So we will have one class, and from it we create many objects. Each object has different values for their properties. But they are essentially the same thing, and we can treat them as the same thing. So if we have a list of objects, we know that all of them, if they are the same type, are going to have a name, a number, and an address. So this is the basics of object-oriented programming. I know it's been a bit difficult, but hopefully I've managed to explain it in such a way that you now understand that a class is kind of like the table header. It says what properties the object is going to have, and then each object has different values for that property, although they are the same underlying thing. Let's move on to the next lecture, where I'm going to try to explain a bit more on this, and also explain a bit more about methods. So stay tuned, and let's go to the next one.